right? We get our messages on Facebook. And the system will collapse. Too many people don't pay their taxes, you get Greece. Right? And that's a tension between us as individuals and us collectively as a society. Right? So we might individually want each other's stuff, but we all are better off living in a society where no one steals. Right? We might individually not want to pay our taxes, but we all are better off living in a society where everybody else. And actually, more to the point, we're better off living in a society where everyone cooperates except us. Right? So, you know, I want, your, I want to live in a society where I can steal, but I'm better off living in a society where there's no theft because I get the benefits of living in a theft-free society. But I'm way better off if I can, one, live in a society where no one steals and steal. Right? I get the benefits of a theft-free society and I get your stuff. But again, right, if everybody acts this way, prop, you know, society collapses. It's thing as property. Right? Society doesn't work. Now, right, most of us recognize this. Right? Most of us recognize that it's not in our long-term best interest to act in our short-term self-interest. Right? Most of us don't steal. Right? Not everyone recognizes that. And that's why you have security. And fundamentally, in society, that's why security exists. And the point of security is to keep the number of defectors down to some acceptable minimum. Right? Low enough that society functions. Now notice, of course, that acceptable minimum is not zero. Right? The goal isn't to have zero defectors. And the goal is to have it have it low enough, right? So we get a crime rate that's low enough. We get a murder rate that's low enough. We get a, a crooked taxi driver rate that's low enough that everyone, you know, a rate of food poisoning at their conference lunches. Right? We want that to be low enough, right? Then we all are willing to eat the conference lunch without thinking. So, so that's the mechanism, right? Security is how we induce cooperation. That in turn induces trustworthiness. And that, in turn, enables trust. Right? That's the mechanism. So note, and, and you know, as, as a security guy, I'm sort of, you always get pinged for this. I'm not making any claims on the moral stance of society or the defectors. Right? You know, when, I, when I talk about rules and rule breaking, I mean, I, I'm not making any claims about whether the rules are inherently moral. Right? In, in a society of slave owners, those who fight slavery are the defectors. Right? We're just looking at social norms, people going against them. You can, I mean, there's a great book uh, written about the, uh, the security mechanisms that uh, the underworld, I mean, criminal organizations use to make sure their members cooperate with the norms of that criminal organization. Right? So defecting would be talking to the police. I mean, that's what, that's how you, that's how you break the rules, you cooperate with the police. And so, it's, so the security mechanism is the same, I'm really not making any, 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 any moral stance here. Right, so, so that's, so now we have a basic mechanism. How do we do it? So, in, in my book, I define a series of what I call societal pressures, and these are, these are mechanisms society uses to induce cooperation. And I like the term pressure because in a sense it is. Right? It's a way society as a group pressures individuals to conform with their social norms. And you know, we can all sort of imagine examples of these. Uh, the first category I call morals. And by that I mean something very general. I mean, I mean anything that happens inside your head. And a lot of security, a lot of conformity, a lot of, of compliance with social norms is enabled by, by, by our, what goes on in our, you know, wholly in our heads. Right? You know, most of us don't steal, not because it's against the law, but because stealing is wrong. So senses of guilt, senses of shame, uh, 
uh, senses of wanting to be compliant or obedient. There's lots of stuff going on here. It's a combination of innate and, and social factors. A lot of really good uh, research in, in neuro, neuropsychology on you know, where in the brain we feel these things. It, it, they, they do, a lot of it does seem to be innate. And some of it, you know, I, it seems sort of similar to the way Chomsky looks at language, <clears throat> that we have some innate capacity for morals, and then there are our external moral codes that are imposed on that, just like external languages. But a lot of it seems to be you know, very, very human. The second type of societal pressure is, is, is reputation. And this is very different. It also comes from our heads, but it's very different because it has to do with how others respond to our actions. And this is a much bigger and much stronger type of societal pressure. At a very basic level, we get praised for good behavior and snubbed for bad behavior. You know, I don't know, if, a friend, if I invite a friend over and he steals my sweater, I'm not going to call the police. He's not going to invite him over anymore. And if one of you jumped up and attacked the person sitting next to them, we probably wouldn't call the police. We'd just get you out of the room. Right? And that sort of, of, of social consequences, both short-term and long-term, is what I think of as, as reputation. And, and for, for humans, this is actually a really big deal. We are very, very sensitive to reputation information about ourselves, about others. You know, there are theories of language that it uh, evolved to help us scale our reputation information. Right? The visual definition is the word gossip, right? information about other people. And I mean, humans are unique here. There, there are other animals that deal in reputation. Uh, all primates, a lot of mammals, some birds recognize individuals and respond to it based on the history with those individuals. We are the only species that can transfer reputation information. Right? I can tell you about him. And that's a huge deal. Right? That allows reputation to scale in a way that no other species can imagine. That's even before we invented the newspaper. Which is, you know, is another way that reputation scales nationally you know, and now globally. Right, through the press. We are, so there's actually this one great experiment I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about, which I think really shows how, how sensitive you are to reputation information. This was done, I think it was done in the United States. It was done at, in a university psychology department at, a, at an honesty coffee station. And yeah, I'm sure you have these here. Right? There's a coffee pot in, in the, in the uh, department somewhere. And there's a box for money, and you're supposed to take a cup of coffee and you put a coin in the box. The nice thing about this system, I maybe mean, a couple things. One, nobody's watching, right? It's, it's purely a system that's going to be secured by morals. Right? There's no, there's no reason why someone can't steal if they don't want to. But because you've got a cash box, you have a very easy way of measuring how honest the group is. Now you can you, you know, measure the amount of coffee, drug, count the money in the box, you know exactly. What your, what your theft rate is. So the researchers did, I actually love this experiment, they took a photograph of a pair of eyes and put it behind the cash box. <laughs> Not making this up. And they found that that, that that photograph increased compliance dramatically. That's, and it's simply a reminder that someone might be watching. It's not even someone watching. Right? It's a reminder that there are human eyes in this world, and they might be looking at you. Make people more honest. I mean, when you think of this in terms of, of, of religion, and the notion that a, a, you know, some higher power, a deity, is watching individuals and judging their morality. Right? Just that belief makes people more moral. <laughs> So these two societal pressures, right, morals and reputation, are very old. Right? They're, they're as old as human society. You can see them in other animals. And morality is not only in humans. You see, you see the same brain functions in other primates. And I think of this as our primitive uh, societal pressure toolkit. Right? This is how we, as you know, an early species, 
kept people honest, kept security. How we got our small societies to function through those two things. The problem with them is, is they don't scale very well. A lot of really interesting research done on the natural sizes of human groups. Robin Dunbar has some great work in, in looking at natural group sizes. And finds that as groups get larger, and, and the number he, he likes to use is 150, you know, plus or minus, that a lot of these mechanisms start failing. You know, that groups, that groups can't keep security when they get much larger than that. And so larger communities, you know, we have developed mechanisms to deal with that. And some of it is, uh, is uh, specialization and delegation. And some of it is, is through technology. You know, so we've allowed our societies to scale to even larger numbers. So the third type of societal pressure I, I like to think about is institutional. You can think of it as laws, but I don't have the word laws because, I mean, if you think of, let's say, the criminal organization, they're not really making laws, they have rules. They're sort of, they're less formal than laws. Laws are, are, inher are inherently government, government prescribed rules as opposed to uh, just rules of any group. But if you think of them, what they really are are norms that have been codified and whose enforcement has been delegated. So we codify our rules about theft, and then we delegate enforcement to the police. <coughs> and, and we can we can enforce in two different ways, right? We can enforce through uh, rewards or sanctions. I mean, just like in, in reputational security, you can either have rewards for following the social norms and sanctions for not. As you scale, though, you tend to rely on sanctions more because if you think about it, it just tends to be cheaper and more efficient. And if you have a group and you've got most everybody complying with the norm, a few people defecting, it's much cheaper to penalize the few defectors than it is to reward the many uh, people who are complying, the many, the many cooperators. Right? It, it, it's just more efficient that way. There are occasional exceptions. Right? I know in the United States, uh, so there are some tax incentives which you can look at as, as mechanisms that reward cooperators. But in general, we tend to be all about punishing defectors. When you get at the institutional level, simply because it's large enough. Uh, the last type of societal pressure uh, I, I, I talk about are security systems. And, and by this I mean any mechanisms, artificial mechanisms, designed to induce cooperation or prevent defection or induce trust directly or compel compliance. So, I mean, you think of what, door locks and <coughs> Door locks and, and gates and fences, alarm <coughs> systems and guards, uh, forensic systems, audit systems, mitigation systems, recovery systems. So in my field, anything we do for a living, it falls under, uh, under this, uh, this category of security systems. And what I think is real important and interesting is that in the real world, all four of these work together. I mean, it's never one or the other. You know, so I don't know, to go back to stealing. Right? Most of us don't steal because we know it's wrong. A lot of us don't steal because of what our friends think. Some of us don't steal because we'll go to jail. And way up here, a few of us don't steal because we can't pick the door lock. <laughs> but you know, when I give this talk to security people, what's interesting is my entire audience is only ever working right up here. All they ever think about are these artificial mechanisms? How do we make passwords longer? And that's where they are. But really, right, this entire gamut is important. I mean, go back to that eyes experiment. I mean, would it be true that if we put the picture of people on their bank website, we <coughs> produce banking fraud? I mean, I don't know, but if it would work, it'd be like the cheapest security measure ever in the history of the planet. <laughs> and so you do see them all. Now, eBay is a great example. eBay feedback of a reputation-based security mechanism. Now, it, 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 does, it, it does reduce fraud, but it does it wholly based on reputation. Right? If you cheat somebody, they write bad feedback about you. 
And I mean, it, it's different now, but back in the early days of eBay, you could, it was really interesting to see how that worked, how jealously dealers would guard their reputation, to go out of their way to refund money when buyers are unsatisfied, because they wanted very much to have a perfect feedback rating. That, that was valuable. And that, that perfect reputation was very valuable. Really interesting. So, so when, I, when I think about this, I think of it very much in, in, in terms of a, uh, of a balance. Right? So an individual has to make, I mean, any moment an individual make a cooperate defense decision. Should I steal or should I not? And, and these societal pressures are how society puts its finger on the scales. Right? How do we affect that cooperate defect decision? How do we make it so most people decide to cooperate? <coughs> now, right, how this works, I mean, the details depends a lot on context. I mean, I don't think you could, and I get asked pretty regularly, you know, you know which, which one is more important, what kind of mix is ideal. It all depends on context. I mean, there's no one answer. And in general, society will use these pressures to find an optimal balance between cooperating and defecting. Right? Remember, the goal is not to get the defection rate down to zero. I mean, that it, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. But then there's going to be some optimal level. Right? You know, too many defectors is too damaging. And too few detectors, defectors is too expensive. <coughs> and we as society determine that balance. I mean, it's sort of organically. When you think about oh, the crime rate in, 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 in your community, right? the crime rate gets too high, people start saying, you know, the crime rate's too high, we need more police. The crime rate gets too low, people start saying, why are we spending so much money on police? We have these other social problems to solve. Right? So you'll get that. And, and there's not just one level. It depends on culture. It depends on what, what era we're living in. You know, what's right for, for me today is not the same as what's right for someone else 500 years ago or 50 years ago. What's right in the United States is different than what's right in, in France or Australia or Japan or Buenos Aires. You know, it, it will be different. So I maintain, and, and I do this a lot more in the book, that, that this way of looking at society, I think, has some broad explanatory powers. And I use examples to talk about terrorism, or the recent global financial crisis, or organized crime, or, or crime on the internet. And what really intrigues me, and this, is, this came up in a, in a discussion that I was having outside earlier, that a lot of this is very interrelated and very interdisciplinary. Funny, and in writing my book, I, I was talking about uh, access to journals and their inside and outside universities. And, and for, to write this book, I actually got university access to journals from a colleague. And it, it, it was really important. I mean, I think I downloaded a, a, literally thousands of, of, of papers looking at these issues. And, and I'm pulling stuff from psychology and economics and game theory and evolutionary biology and neuroscience philosophy, anthropology, law, political science, uh, even theology in there. And you know, I remember from my days at the university, this, these journals weren't just on you know, other places in the library, they were in other libraries. And I actually believe, as a totally side point, that, that the availability of journals on the internet, I think will, will cause a renaissance in interdisciplinary work simply because it's so much easier to read what some other discipline has to say about what you're thinking. And now, my hope is that will also mean that these papers will become more readable. <laughs> right? Because people outside their field will now be reading them and citing them. And so there's, there's a lot of complications in, in this model and in this research. You know, I, I, this notion of self-interest versus group interest, if you think about it, is actually very simplistic. But really what goes on is, is I think, for any decision, there are multiple competing interests. 
So you might think of you, know, you as a family member versus you as a community member. Uh, you as an employee versus you as a citizen. Just different aspects of yourself. And, and I, you find when you start looking at real examples of how this works, different groups each use societal pressures to try to influence the individuals one way or the other. And a lot is being written in the United States about, uh, about uh, corporate governance and corporations trying to do the lawful, the moral thing, and how we have individuals in corporations can and, and do do things that are against society's interests. Really, that, that's, that's a tension between that individual looking at him as a member of that, of that profit-making corporation's employee versus a member of his community, and how those poles are different and how that comes out in whistleblowers, and there's certain other ways. There's a lot of good writing on this. Uh, there, there's a lot of, of, of good research on the interplay between morals and reputation. I mean, I pulled them apart. I'm doing a stark separation between things that happen in your head just from you and, and your head based on the reactions of others. But those two evolved simultaneously, and it, it can be hard to pull them apart. And there are people writing who, who say that it's really just one thing. You know, I, some of the you know, uh, metric I'll use is that guilt is something you feel in your head, and shame is something you feel based on how others perceive you. And other people will say that's a complete nonsense distinction. And so I think that there's, there's a lot there. Uh, and I kind of gave a pretty much a character uh, description of a law, right, as codifying a social norm. You know, you, we know that that isn't always true. And very often, laws go against the society in which they're operating, right? That, that rulers do not just codify norms that they consolidate power. You know, and how that works, I think, is real interesting. Uh, and I talked a bit about scaling, but I think scaling is one of the, uh, the, the critical things, and I'll actually come back to it later, on how societal pressures work. That Different, different aspects of this have different natural scalings. And roles and reputation, there's a lot written about in-group versus out-group. And how we as humans are very attuned to in-group versus out-group. And that when, the, when the groups don't exist, we tend to invent them. Uh, I'm blanking on that. It's a book by David Burberry, I'm blanking on the name. He writes, Us and, Us and Them, it's called. And he writes about the sort of in-group versus out-group distinction. And, you know, and morals, right? we tend to have strong moral feelings for those close to us. You know, our, our immediate family, our extended family, our community, our city, our country, the group of countries that speak our language, the group of countries that look vaguely like us. And morals tend to tail off. We don't feel as much sympathy with you know, people who look differently, speak a different language, have a natural disaster than if it happens uh, closer to us cognitively. But on the other hand, you know, we are the only species that has universal morals. So the morals seem to tail down and sort of go up at the edges. And we, we have morals that apply to all humans, or even all species of life, for some of us. I think it's real interesting. Right? Laws you know, scale differently, and of course technology scale differently. And there's a lot, I think, that, that can be talked about in uh, the effects of group decision making on all of us. I mean, a lot of times it's not us as individuals making cooperative effect decisions, it's us as groups. It's something we might not do individually, we might do if there's a group of us reaching consensus. A lot of great work uh, in, in the psychology of group decisions, which I think is real interesting and applicable. Uh, you know, how this plays out in common groups, in a corporate structure, in a government structure, I think is also interesting. Well, what I figured I'd talk about here, sort of in more depth, because in a sense we're all technologists, is how technology affects things. Because right? fundamentally I'm also a technologist, and, and the value to me is to look at how technology at the moment is changing things and how we can possibly you know, get ahead of it. So technology, when, when thinking about security, thinking about trust, I think it's fundamentally about scale. Technology allows societies to scale. And that affects these pressures in, in very real ways. 
So, I mean, so we scale in lots of dimensions, right? More people, uh, increased complexity, uh, you know, new social systems like Facebook, uh, increased technological intensity, increased frequency, increased distance. I mean, you're at a conference talking about artificial persons, which is a huge other scaling and complexity. Right? So, so see, scale happens. And you know, if we think about societal pressures as resulting in a balance between cooperators and defectors, what technology does is it upsets the balance. It changes something. You know, maybe a crime becomes easier. Maybe law enforcement becomes easier. And so technology changes something, and in response, society has to rebalance somehow. You know, maybe some new laws or some new technologies, maybe some new group norms. I mean, an interesting example of that we're seeing right now is, uh, is copyright. I mean, technology drastically changed the scale at which you could copy music or movies. And the response is either, we're seeing both of them at the same time, is the, the, mu the entertainment industry fighting back with technology to prevent copying, and all other group of people saying, no, no, the social norms have changed. That the notion of, of copyright doesn't really apply in the same way in the world of this new technology. And you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna see who's right. I have my bets on new social norms. But we're in the midst of that change. Right? So this is an iterative process. Okay? So you, you have these, these feedback loops where technology changes something and then you have, then you have to rebalance, technology changes again. And, and the idea is that you know, stability is the result and that's the goal. What's interesting is I'm not sure that's achievable anymore. Because in this feedback system, attackers have a natural advantage. I mean, some of it's a basic first mover advantage, but most of it is, is because attackers tend to be more agile. Right? So, I mean, they don't have the institutional inertia that society does. So I, it's an easy example. Uh, someone invents the motor car. Right? And the police say, well, that looks like a good idea. And they have a, a study group to study the car, and they produce an RFP and go out for bids and accept proposals and choose a manufacturer and buy a car and have a training procedure and a usage manual. And meanwhile, the burglar says, oh, look, new getaway vehicle. And doesn't have the, there's no institutional inertia that prevents the burglar from using it immediately. But, and we saw this on the internet. Right? Internet commerce appears in the mid-90s, and really within moments you have this new breed of cyber criminal that appeared out of nowhere that knew how to take advantage of, of the internet to steal money. Right? Meanwhile, the police, who trained on Agatha Christie novels, <laughs> it took, what, seven to ten years to catch up. And, you know, as someone in computer security, I remember those seven to ten years, and they were really painful. As the police had no freaking clue how the internet worked, how the crime worked, what a computer was. It was kind of embarrassing. You know, they did catch up, but it took time. I, mean, I think a similar example is happening right now in Syria. This, it, it's worth looking up. Uh, John Perry Barlow. He's a, a pretty much a famous uh, internet freedom fighter from, from the previous decade. Wrote a great essay in like 1995 called "The Declaration of Freedom in Cyberspace," which basically said things like, "You know, cyberspace will transcend all governments. Freedom is organic. Nya nya. We're all over you." <laughs> and we all believed it back then. You know, fast forward to today, and we're seeing in countries like Syria. The government is using the internet to surveil, identify, and arrest dissidents. They're using it to pump out propaganda, and they're shutting it down when it looks like it'll benefit the, the protesters, their adversaries. Now, it's not that it's not that the internet favored the uh, the defector, right, the bad guy in, in this scenario, the, the dissidents. Is that they were able to make use of the technologies first and fastest. 
Okay? But in the end, technologies tend to magnify power. And those who have power will get more power through technology. But just it's slower for them. So the interesting question is, how slow is, is too slow? Because you've got something, you've got sort of a security gap here. Right? You know, and that time between when the defectors can make use of new technology and when the cooperators, when society can, right? that time delay is a, is a security gap. <laughs> and if you think about it, that gap tends to be larger in times when there's more technology and in times of rapid technological change. Actually, in times of rapid social change due to rapid technological change. And we are living in a time of, well, one, more technology than ever before, and two, greater social change in the technology than ever before. Which means this societal security, this security gap, is greater than it's ever been before. You can see the same kind of uh, dynamic if you look at uh, the, the uh, Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, Industrial Revolution, Elizabethan times, in, the, in there, you'll, you'll see a lot of these same things, but not to the degree you're seeing it today. Right? There's more and more, faster and faster technological change, which is driving, I think, very rapid <coughs> change in how defectors operate. Uh, you follow something like ATM fraud. It's a really interesting way of watching that. So the evolution of, of the fraudsters keeping one step ahead of the ATM machine manufacturers and the banks. <coughs> so for many years, the big deal problem were, were card skimmers. And they've gotten very good. I don't know if they, you have them in the UK. We have them all over the United States. It, and criminals will make these overlays that sit in front of the card slot. And when you put your card in, they grab a, a copy of it. And this, is, this, this primarily clones uh, Stripe cards, but we have started to see chip and pin cloning. Because you'll also have a camera that will grab the pin. And you can then, you're a criminal, you set this up on an ATM machine in a way that's disguised right, it's painted correctly, and then you can skim a bunch of, uh, a bunch of credentials and steal money. It's been a problem for years, there are a bunch of, of, of half-baked solutions that more or less work. Uh, I read two weeks ago, I mean, just read in, in, in a security blog, that now criminals are moving towards uh, blocking the, uh, the cash slot. So, and and uh, the blog is Brian Krebs as well. Actually, I blog. It's in my blog. And, and uh, there's a picture. It looks like kind of a funny bent paper clip. But basically, if you know what you're doing, you, you stick this in the, in, the, uh, in the slot that the money comes out of, and it blocks the cash. And then you come back an hour later, and you pull all the cash out. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of this. <laughs> Right? But now that it's been thought of, it's going to happen more and more until the machine designers figure out a way to design a jam-proof dispenser type system. Or right, I mean, a system where the money can't go out if it's you know, retracted back. You, come up with, you can come up with ways to deal with this, but it requires a redesign. Right? There is going to be a delay of retrofitting machines with this new technology, and that new machines might never get to parts of the world that don't have the, don't have the money to afford these new technologies. So, I mean, what this really means is that it's, it's harder and harder to get societal pressures right. And it's funny, in, in my field of computer security, we're starting to see a realization of this. Uh, there's, a, there's a big security conference every year called the RSA Conference in California in February. And just this year, I started seeing uh, more and more examples of, of this type of thinking. And I've heard it called reactive security or agile security or lean security. I mean, it used to be that, that as companies, we would say, you know, buy my widget and you'll be safe. Right? Complete lie, but, you know, we, we, we want you to buy our widgets because that's, that's how we make money. But that's always been the advertising slogan. I mean, look at any antivirus company, right? Buy my antivirus product and you'll be safe. Now the slogan is more, 
you know, you're, we know you're not safe. Call us after the bad stuff happens, and we'll help you get back on your feet. Right? So that recognition that you, we can't get ahead of the bad guys, but if we can react quickly enough, we'll, we'll do good. And if you know antivirus products, that's basically how they work. It's funny, in the early days of antivirus, like in the 80s, uh, you had two competing schools of thought. One was the, the, the signature-based. Right? Dumb antivirus products would recognize viruses by the signatures and would block them. Or smart antivirus products that would learn virus-like behavior <clears throat> right? and block things that did virus-like behavior. The idea being that unknown viruses, right, where there are no signatures, you catch through this more intelligent way of, uh, of identifying viruses. But it turns out that like a Microsoft software install is indistinguishable from a virus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of legitimate things are, because, because a virus is not about the code, it's about the intentions of the person behind the code. So the industry is basically settled on this dumb approach. And right now, if you have, I mean, you all better have antivirus, you probably have it set to update every day. Every day at some time, it, it goes, phones back on the internet and gets the new signatures of the day. And most days there are new signatures. So if you sort of think about what, what this type of security regime is, what we're saying is that you know, we as a community will stay safe by sacrificing a few of us. Right? The few early victims <clears throat> get caught by the virus but the antivirus companies very quickly see it, identify it, write a signature, and push it out. In some ways, it's similar to the herd of half a million gazelles wandering around the East African plains. I mean, it's okay that there are you know, 500 lions circling their herd. And the herd will survive because, because the group will react, even though a few individuals will get hurt. You know, I, I'm finally starting to see this type of thinking in, in uh, terrorism and airplane security. And if you think about the history, I mean, the history of, of, ter of airplane terrorism and security, it's all about reacting to what happened last time. Right? We, we screen for guns and bombs, terrorists use box cutters. We take away box cutters and knitting needles, and they put a bomb in their shoes. We screen shoes, they use liquids. We take away liquids, they put a bomb in their underwear. Right, we use full body scanners, they're going to do something else. Right? This is a stupid game. And a game would be that, that would make sense not to play. You know, it's much more, it's much smarter to be able to react quickly against what happens versus to try to prevent what happened last time. Especially when you have an intelligent and adaptive adversary. Right, so, okay, so, so most technologies benefit the, uh, the defenders. Sometimes it benefits the, it benefits the uh, sorry, benefits the attackers. Sometimes it benefits the defenders. I mean, fingerprint technology is a good example. Uh, the radio, which changed uh, policing more than anything else in the history of the planet. Because I mean, it used to be policemen were lone actors. You know, being able to radio, back, radio for backup <coughs> made a huge difference. Right, so a couple of final points. One, uh, you know, no matter how much societal pressure you deploy, there always will be defectors. I think this is important. Right? Increasing societal pressure isn't always worth it. And you have a basic law of diminishing returns. Uh, societal pressures also, also can prevent cooperations. As you get more, your false alarm rate goes up, and, and, and you know, the base rate penalty kicks in, and you have a lot more problems. So there always is some optimal level in society, and it's never 100% cooperation. It's sooner or later, at some academic conference, one of you will jump up and attack the person sitting next to them. <laughs> it's probably happened. Probably at an anthropology conference. Where it's a lot of <laughs> okay, other point is we, we all defect at some times in some things. Like nobody's 100% cooperative. Nobody cooperates all the time. Right? Nobody, is, nobody cooperates 0% of the time. Nobody cooperates all the time. 
And, and really, I always think of, of security as a tax. But security is a tax on the honest. Right? It, it's, it's a tax we pay not to get a benefit, but to prevent a problem. And it's a tax we pay that pays the guard over there that, that keeps people from stealing stuff out of the room. And lastly, society needs defectors. I think this is important. The, the groups benefit from the fact that some people don't follow social norms. Because not following social norms is the seed for societal change. Right? A totalitarian state might be law, more law-abiding, but it's not more fun. And so in the end, you know, having a system that allows for defection, I think, is, is a very valuable in society. So that's the talk. Happy to take questions. Oh, there's like many hands. This is excellent. I'll let someone else decide who to call. Scaling up, um, scaling up uh, punishment and rewards. I was thinking about how um, people react better to uh, rewards than punishments. I think that's a standard psychological result. Um, and also, uh, there's the type of um, reinforcement learning where even if the reward is somewhat randomly distributed or like randomly given, uh, the the person will still often perform the behavior. Um, so it seems like we could randomly uh, reward cooperators, even if uh, rewarding all of them would be too much. We could reward a few of them randomly, and that would increase the rate of uh, cooperation. I mean, it certainly works with gambling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And you probably could get the uh, economics to work like that. I mean, it's just obviously because gambling is profitable for the casinos. But you don't see a lot of that. I mean, some of it, you see some of it socially. I mean, you, I mean, you're nice all the time, and once in a while, you get a great benefit from being nice. But you know, as it gets more institutionalized, societies tend not to like that sort of, you know, if you do a good thing, we'll give you a lottery ticket, which is basically what, what the system you're, you, you're talking about. You tend not to see it institutionally. Although I agree, I think it makes perfect sense. And you will see it. When uh, in the United States, I've seen it as done for advertising, done to try to uh, try to get social norms that you know, basically for-profit social norms. That instead of giving someone a benefit, they give them a chance at a prize. Right? Answer our survey, and you'll get enrolled in our drawing, kind of thing. But yeah, I agree. I think that's actually a really interesting way to make things work, and I bet it would work better than that punishment. Right. So, so we'll pick 20 people to rob banks this year and give them a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> right paid for by the deposits of everybody else. It actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks for the very rich and diverse talk. Uh, I'm wondering whether, well, how should I put it? Well, you tried to mention the, try to construct the relations between security and trust. And I'm w actually wondering how it works in that direction because now that we heard a lot of news on increasing security, actually decreased trust. Mm -hmm. So, say for example, increasing security in airport actually decreased trust for the citizens in a particular country. And how, in your case or how in your theory, will explain this kind of relations inside of a positive correlation of that? Yeah, and it's actually it's a really complex feedback loop going on. And I don't think the airport is actually an interesting example because for some people. Right, increased police presence in airports on the streets decreases the feeling of trust. Right? It makes people wonder, you know, why are all the police here? I guess I should be scared. <laughs> right? yeah, and that also is very cultural. You know, I, I mean, a great example is Israel. I go to Israel, there are police with machine guns everywhere. And that makes me nervous. But most of the people I talk to from Israel say, no, no, we like that. That makes us feel better. So but there's a lot of cultural stuff going on. Something that I believe is the difference between reality of security and perceived security. 
And there's a phrase I've come on called security, th it was security theater, which is security designed to look at but doesn't actually do anything. I think there are mechanisms of security that don't work, and people tend to see through that and then get more scared. Right? There, there, are, there are different ways to security that increase trust, and there are ways that don't. Uh, some of it is uh, learned helplessness. That, uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll see this in the United States, that an over-reliance on a organizational defense, people's individual sense of defense tends to atrophy. So if you expect the government will bail you out and prevent a natural disaster, you do less prepare yourself. So you, you have a lot of different feedback groups. And I think that is really interesting. And there's, there's, there's a bunch going on there. I mean, it again shows that none of this is simple. Hi, um, thanks very much for the talk. There are about, uh, in this room, I reckon about half the room um, to do with artificial intelligence are very optimistic about the benefits of this particular technology, and half of us are quite concerned at potential risks involved. And I'd like to talk about that in the context of the um, defectors versus cooperators. Now, having a baseline of defectors is fine in most contexts. Only about 50% of the Irish government is corrupt, and we do just fine. <laughs> <laughs> However, there are some circumstances in which this doesn't work. I mean, for example, if you're developing a technology that might, if it gets out of hand, have potentially disastrous consequences, all you need is the one. Now, for all the people who are skeptical about AI risk, um, if you don't believe that one, how about the USA could probably cause enough climate damage all on its own that if the rest of the world agreed not to um, do it, the world would still be in trouble. Same could be applied to synthetic biology, same could be applied to, say, geoengineering. If we decided to build a giant pipe up into the sky and pump particles in, that would be a decision made by one that affects everyone. Now, is there any way of dealing with a situation where you need full cooperation and where one single defector can ruin the whole um, game or open Pandora's box? Yeah, the sad thing is actually not really. I mean, if you think about it, right? If you think about the way security normally works, that it's a basic insurance market. You multiply the percent chance you have of, of getting whacked times the damage if you are whacked, and that's the annualized loss expectancy, and then you can build a shared risk model around that. Right? I mean, that, that's the way it works. What you're talking about are, are the, uh, the edge cases. The probability of, of, of the damage drops to zero. The, the damage goes up to infinity, Zero times infinity, last time I took a class in that, equals every number on the number line at the same time. Which means all your conventional risk measurements don't work. Nothing works. So there's really no way to deal with that. I mean, there just isn't. You know, short, short of, uh, you know, nothing. So, so. <laughs> And, and, and this is why, I mean, this is fundamentally the problem of weapons of mass destruction. That's why they're so fucking scary. Okay, we can go home. Right? Because, <laughs> because, because one defector does so much damage. And any time you, you're dealing with uh, you know, systemic software risk, some, some drop on the internet, uh, synthetic biology, all of these things where one lone defector can, can affect things far outside his sphere of... Uh, Concern. I think the answer is no. There's really no way to deal with that. That's that's you know that is not optimistic. On the other hand, I actually am optimistic. So you might ask, how the hell do you sleep at night? <laughs> you know, I think in general that we as a species tend to figure this stuff out. <laughs> now, right. The problem is, I mean, you're so, the thing, so I, 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 I have math ways of visualizing things. When you think of, uh, of attacks as the noise, and, and, the, and you have noise in your system, but your system you know, stays on a fairly even keel. The problem is, once your noise you know, gets so large that it disrupts your underlying system. And that noise can come from a lot of defectors or one very powerful defector. And how we deal with one very, very powerful defector we don't know. It really is an open question. 
And I think it is a scary one. Did I help? <laughs> Been okay so far. <laughs> well, it happens. Uh, uh, you refer to societal change. Uh, Bennett famously argued that freedom and morality evolve. From a security viewpoint, can you give examples of beneficial and harmful societal change? You know, it all depends on society, right? For, for a lot of, uh, you know, for spreading out of this planet, the internet is, the internet is a harmful style change. I mean, censorship of the internet is, is going up every year. Right? For a lot of us, the internet is a great beneficial change. You know, it's often it's the same technologies that are beneficial or are harmful. And so I, I mean, so really it is contextual. I think it's certainly true that, that morals, uh, morals evolve. And, 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 they, and, they, and they have evolved in a good direction. I, mean, the, 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 I think the, the fantastic book, uh, Why Violence Has Declined, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, Pinker's book, is a really good discussion of really how our morals have changed dramatically over the past you know, two or three thousand years. And, and generally towards the more inclusive, more moral. And as Martin Luther King Jr. who said, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And it, so I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in, as a species, our ability to, to become more moral. And I think that, in the end, is, you know, if anything saves us, it will be that. The problem is that technology is now moving so fast. Now, I, I, oddly enough, I work for BT. Don't ask. Um, <laughs> but they have a slogan, I don't know if they still have it, called Change at the Speed of Life. And I think they meant it as change really fast. <laughs> but I think of it as slow down the change. Because right? the speed of life is actually slower now than the pace of technology. Right? My father is not good at integrating new technologies. Right? I'm better, but my kids' generations are way better. I mean, the internet is the greatest generation gap since rock and roll. And, and, you know, and the, the pace of change, I think, it is outpacing our ability to integrate it. We see that in, in the way laws seem to be obsoleted by, by technology, not just you know, computer technology. Uh, the, the, global, the financial crisis of 2008 really was financial technology outstripping the laws in place to regulate the financial industry. And I see you think you see that everywhere. So, a lot of people here. So much like, who's, who's the person the oh, there you are. <laughs> so, a lot of people here are trying to design uh, an autonomous, intelligent, self-guided systems that learn themselves. Do you have any tips for making them be cooperators, not defectors? How do you make uh, a cooperator? I, I, I guess you don't code defection in, right? <laughs> I mean, right, I mean, what does affection come from? It comes from individual self-interested units. Not autonomous units, but autonomous self-interest units trying to maximize their own survival. I mean, I mean, I mean shouldn't Asimov's three laws of robotics solve the problem? I haven't thought about it. But, right, but it, it should be, you should, it, if you don't, I mean, if you don't build in the capability to optimize in that way. But you know, I would argue that any general purpose intelligence will optimize in that way naturally. So which means you're constantly going to fight the tide. I suppose I'm really asking, why do people defect that? You know? People defect for personal advantage. Why does someone steal? Because the benefits of stealing outweigh the, the, the detriments. And some of it is, is like bad analytics. And great work uh, done by some economists actually in the UK a couple of years ago to show that the the uh, basically a life of, of bank robbery was a really crappy way to make a living. <laughs> when you looked at you know how much money you get, how likely you are to go to jail. I mean, basically, it's a stupid career path. <laughs> I mean, it makes no sense. Right? So the people who are choosing it are, are have faulty analysis of right of the data. Right? They, they're not they're not they're not getting it. So some of it's that. 
Some of it is, you know, we're looking at gains versus losses. Those at the bottom, with nothing to lose, the math, the math is different, right? You, you've got some lower bound here. There's a whole, there are a whole lot of reasons why people choose to defect. Right? They get that they, they have to understand it. But also, their, uh, their analysis is different than the norm. This, a, a sociopath is a really interesting example. And, and they're, they're worth studying. Sociopaths are natural defectors <coughs> because a lot of the thing, a lot of the benefits we get from cooperating, they don't get. And so their calculus is just going to be different because their <coughs> value system is different. These, are, these aren't objective measurements. And some of us might feel really good when we don't steal and everyone likes us. Some of us, you know, might be annoyed we don't get the thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're living in... Oh, I ran out of battery, so I'll just speak loud. Um, so we live in an age where we can see increasing technology, uh, maybe getting to a stage where not only are we carrying out around our mobile phones and portable organisers and internet portals, but we'll also be logging, life logging, um, everything that goes on around us. Um, and there's a bit of a tension between like privacy um, and transparency. And so people want control of their information, they want to be the arbiters of themselves or who they are, um, and they may not want some sort of top-down approach where um, Facebook decides who you are and how you represent it. But, um, I mean, when it comes to defection, and you, you, you're willing to defect while standing in plain sight from so many different points of view, how, how do you see that happening? I mean, like, it, it, it'll be so obvious to people when there are eyes looking at them all the time, if they lie, um, it's going to be hard to cover up later by, you know. Yeah, and, and it's sort of interesting to see the effects of, of ubiquitous surveillance on a lot of this. And, and I mean, the, the anonymous... Not only surveillance, surveillance, yeah. like little brothers and sisters the, everywhere. The, the, the anonymous uh, movement is a really interesting example of, of this. You know, how does... What does civil disobedience look like in the information age? In some ways, is the you question. Can't, you don't know who anonymous is. That's right. And, and so there are, you know, there are ways that they're preserving, and, then they, and they're more or less effective, right? I mean, individuals tend to get rounded up by the police, and, and you know, so it works or it doesn't. Uh, I think it's good to be, what would, these are, I think, interesting social experiments. It's the first time we've ever lived in this type of society. So I don't think we really know uh, the answers of, you know, is there going to be less defection? in a world where your every move is noticed. I mean, uh, Daniel Solov has written uh, a book on, on public shame, on, on the internet age. And there's some really you know, powerful examples of someone does something uh, in public, someone else takes a Facebook, uh, takes a, a, a cell phone snap and goes on Facebook, and suddenly a million people know what this person did and, and, and how that changes uh, what's going on. Uh, in, in China, a lot of the, uh, I mean, there is surveillance, there is the Great Firewall of China, but most of the censorship is self-censorship because people know they might be watched. Right? So how, how the, threat of, the threat of observation changes behavior even if it's not there. I mean, this is the, the panopticon. Uh, I mean, we are, we are in the early days of this. It's, I mean, and I use some good words. I, I, because a lot of people look at this as privacy versus security, that's the balance. And, and the real balance is uh, liberty versus control. And the way to think of these that I think makes sense is in terms of the power balance. Right? That, and, and there's a book written called the Transparent Society which talks about, I mean, basically the thesis is everyone watches everybody else and it's all different but it's all the same. But it doesn't work because of the power difference. Right? When the, if, if a policeman has to see your ID, it's not the same for you to see his ID, right? Because because of the power balance. When you walk into the doctor's office, the doctor says, "Take off your clothes." You can't say, "Well, you first. <laughs> Inherently, that doesn't work. So, think of privacy as as power increasing, right? So, so let's take government versus individual. So. Uh, secrecy in government, right, increases their power. So it's more differential, less liberty. Open government laws decrease government power, less differential, more liberty. Right? Privacy in the individuals increases individual power, 
less differential moral liberty. Right? Forced openness in individuals, more surveillance, increases the power differential, which makes that bad. That's the way I look at it. I actually have an hour-long talk on that question. So I'm going to say that. <laughs> I think um, I'm already over time. All right. Um, just to go back to your distinction between sort of sluggish and dynamic, do you think it would ever be possible to sort of have a dynamic institution in the sense that they would try and beat the criminals at their own game, like I'm trying to be faster than that, or is that just... It's not necessarily faster. The question is not the direction they're running. I mean, yeah, okay, so, you can run a game. What's, I told you about ATM skimmers, and now the thing that's this in, the, uh, in the money slot. What's the next one? I don't have any idea. I mean, it could be in any one of the... What's the next time the entire is going to try? It could be any of a thousand directions. If it, was, if it was just linear, yeah, then we could probably run, we could just outspend them and run faster. But it's not linear, it's n dimensional. So, given that we don't know the direction that the next innovation will come, we can't predict it. That's the problem. There was somebody here, I just don't count. I saw a hand there, I saw a hand there. I'm trying to make a chronological thing. Thank you. Um, with the increased pervasiveness of surveillance and of censorship, what do you think would be the best method for us as a society to avoid the type of dystopian worldwide surveillance society that discourages deviation from currently accepted social norms? So I don't know what I'm currently thinking about. And it's three things. I mean, you mentioned what, surveillance and censorship. The third one is propaganda. Right? These are the three tech, these are the, I think sort of the triumvirate of totalitarian states that are enabled by the internet. Right? Surveillance, censorship, and propaganda. And, and they all have analogs you know, for liberty and freedom. The question is who's using them. And it's, I think, a really interesting question of how you enable the good half of that and disable the bad half, especially because they're, in, they're interrelated. Right? So anonymity, which hurts surveillance, helps propaganda. You know, so it, it, it's, it's really not obvious. This actually is the thing I am thinking about right now. There's a great book called The Internet Delusion by someone whose name I'm forgetting, which writes about this really good worth reading. And I don't think there are any easy answers here, which I guess is good, right? But, but <coughs> the, I, I think it's an important area to start thinking about. Um, I put myself on the list for a second. Um, you, you, earlier, you talked about this, this, uh, the fact that the typical security guys are only talking about a very tiny percentage of the things one can do for security, the locking of the doors the technology, yeah. uh, approach. Um, so if we're talking about artificial agents that would be radically different from us in many ways, you mentioned that we don't really care so much about people in our species who are very far away or different from us. Uh, we, we, eat people, <coughs> we eat our animals and kill them for that purpose. So chances are we are not really caring about other biological things, not to mention non-biological things. And if you make them with much. big heads and big eyes, they'll so, children. <laughs> 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 right. If they look cute, then, then that's uh -huh. good. We had uh, somebody uh, the day before yesterday. Although, although they, I mean, there's a limit, right? Because they look too much like humans, it's disturbing. So you've got to make them just different enough. And I think yeah. Japanese are getting good at hitting that window. Not have a cute without disturbing. Uh, what I'm interested in is the other way around. Is there, is there a way that we could have artificial agents that don't care about us and just look at the making them secure approach? Do you think that... Well, in, in, that in a sense, that's what, that's what a burglar arm is. A burglar alarm doesn't care about context, it just rings when someone, you know, cuts the wire. So I think that, I think that tends to be the default. The default is not having judgment. I think having judgment is the hard thing. So I, I would think that would be easier. Maybe I'm missing something. Sorry. What I'm trying to figure out is, yes, it's, it might be easier. Do you, is there a possibility that it might, this might do the job? So, if security has all these components, as you said, and we are just doing, we, we, we might be unable to do the trust humans job because the thing doesn't care about humans. Uh, is there a possibility that we can get security just by doing the 
It's locked part? It's hard, because security is all about exceptions. I mean, it is rare that you have a security problem of, you know, we have to guard this thing and nobody should ever get to it ever. I mean, like nuclear wastes. We want to launch into the sun. Right? Make it as far away and hard to get to as possible. Almost all security systems have some exception. Nobody should get the thing but me. Right? You know, so, so you have to build the safe and then the locking mechanism with the key. Right? So, and, and it is those exceptions that, that make it difficult and also add the vulnerabilities. It's really easy to build a safe with no door that's really secure. <laughs> <laughs> that's easy. But the, you never want that. So the interesting problems always have exceptions. I mean, even the burglar alarm has you know, a five second time delay and a code you type in to, to turn it off. So I think in any real problem, you have to have some judgment. And the more judgment, the more useful the system is. All right, uh, Bruce, uh, interestingly, my uh, concern is the novice. And uh, the idea that in 1995, 100% uh, of us using the internet were all computer people, and now statistically 100% of the people are not computer people. They're my mother right now. And it's going to get even more to theoretically the point where every person has the opportunity to have all the good things, like you were saying, like all the stuff, but also every bad person having direct access to them. So in terms of, from the simple of where can a password evolve so the grandmother can deal with something that's not a 10 million digit thing or some kind of chip that's implanted in them or something, and all the way to when security becomes everyone's concern, or when everyone has a, a, an interest in computer security. So this is hard. I mean, this is one of our hard problems. And because you really talk about the usability problem. I mean, security tends to butt against usability. I mean, it's much easier if I just open the door of my house and walk in. It's annoying to pull a key out of my pocket and make sure I don't forget it and put it in the lock and get it to work. And, right, all, all that affects usability. Now, for door locks, we've, we've inculcated that, that annoyance. Right? You know, we know we have social methods dealing with keys. We know how, we know how to do it. In computer security, we're not that good yet. It changes pretty rapidly. But I don't think that problem ever goes away. Because, I mean, this is back to security being a tax on the honest. It's not only a tax in money. It's a tax on capabilities, it's a tax on convenience, it's a tax in all these different dimensions. But if it wasn't a tax, then it wouldn't work. Now you can trade them off on each other. You can trade off money for convenience. Right? You have a more expensive security system, right? I can secure my computer by hiring a guard to stand in front of it. Right? It'll be really easy for me to log in, but it gets really expensive. So I, I make it orders of magnitude cheaper and make it slightly less convenient. But you can pretty much always trade those different methods of payment off on each other. And then the, then the, the trick is finding the, the correct one for the space and time you're in. All right, I think I'm getting off stage now. It's like a dinner tonight.